If you want your sports team to be the best that it can be, it's important that all team members are following the same game plan. What's true with sports is also true in the home. Husbands and wives and young folks alike need to be following the same game plan, walking down the same spiritual path. So gather your family and get your Bibles because it's time to begin Fabric of Family. In Him, all families are blessed. Join our discussion on Fabric of Family. You know, Fabric of Family has a lot of different viewers that come from different demographics. And some of our viewers today are, are no doubt Christians. I, I mean, you're members of the New Testament church as identified in Scripture. The Lord is your Savior and you're walking each day to be pleasing unto Him. Heaven is your home and, and your future looks very bright. But yet despite the prospect of eternal joy, maybe, just maybe, your heart is a little heavy today because you know that the one that you're married to has made different choices in their life. Maybe you're married to a non-Christian, an unbeliever. Oh, you love your husband and you love your wife and you want to see them in heaven with you, but as of this day at least, They've not made that important decision that you are so longing for them to make. Maybe you feel like you're kind of spinning your wheels, so to speak, as far as encouraging them in their decision to obey the gospel of Christ. Oh, you want to be united, not just on your mortgage note or, or on your bank account. You want to be united with your spouse in Christ Jesus, but you're just not there yet. And so you want to make sure that you're doing everything that you possibly can do to bring about that important time in their life and in yours. But maybe you and your spouse are united in Christ. But there's another problem that's troubling you. You and your spouse are Christians, but you see, maybe your child is not. In fact, you believe that as far as your child is concerned, they are way past the age of accountability and so many young folks that are their age have long time in the past made that decision to give their life to Christ. Perhaps your child is even a, a grown adult themselves having set up their own household, but yet they've never to this day bowed their knee in obedience to the Lord Jesus. They've never been baptized for the remission of sins as the Bible teaches that we must do in Acts the second chapter and verse 38. And so as a parent, you're naturally concerned. What can you do? What advice does the Bible offer to those who want to convert their unbelieving spouse or children that are past the age in which they ought to obey the gospel? In our discussion panel segment today, I have two guests who are going to explore with me some ways in which we can help to bring about a very positive outcome in the life of those who are in our family but are outside the Lord's church. But before we get into our discussion today, let's watch this next segment by a man by the name of Daniel Howe who preaches for a congregation in Metropolis, Illinois as he talks about the path to reconciliation. Separation. You know, there's nothing more discouraging than having somewhere you'd like to go, but maybe it's like this creek here. It's so wide and it's, it's deep and there's no way to jump across it or go around it and short of swimming through it, you, you just can't get to the other side. That's the point of building bridges. Whether it's a grand suspension bridge, an humble foot bridge, or even an old iron bridge like this one, they all easily take us to a place that we couldn't otherwise go. Bridges bring two coasts that are separated by something back together. Without the bridge, there's no crossing to the other side. Now imagine with me for just a moment that, that on the other side of that divide over there is God and heaven. And there's a bridge there, but, but then you take a torch or a saw or fire or whatever it may be and you destroy that bridge. 
Do you not realize that that's what our sin does to our relationship with God? In Isaiah chapter 59, beginning in verse 1, we read, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. If there was ever a more discouraging realization, I don't know what it would be. There is one thought more discouraging even than that, and that is this, that there's nothing that you can do by yourself or that I can do by myself to make it to the other side. I, there's no one around to help build the bridge. How are you going to make it over there? Well, you see, that's where Christ comes in. Notice with me a passage from Colossians chapter 1. And we'll begin reading down in verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself, by Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now He has reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight. Did you catch what Jesus did? He gave us a chance to be reconciled to God. He built a bridge over that divide. You see, because of our sin, our offense against God, we were separated. We moved. We burned the bridge. But Christ came and through His blood gave us a means to be back with God. He removed the separation. Did you catch what Jesus has done there? What it says is that Jesus came and gave us the chance to be reconciled back to God. He's come and removed that separation. He's built a bridge there. You see, because of our sin, we burned the bridge. We moved. But Christ has come and made a way for us to go back to God. But notice with me the singularity, I guess you could say, of that path. In John 14 and verse 6, Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Did you notice there what he said about himself? He said he was the way. The word way there refers to a road, a path. And by saying that he is the way, he's saying he's the only one. In other words, there is no other road that we can take to make it back to God other than the one that He has built for us to follow. How is it then that we get on and stay on the path to reconciliation with God? Well, it's very simple. It's through obeying His Word. So ask yourself this, with a life that you're living, with the decisions that you're making, with the path that you're walking down, are you on the path to reconciliation with God or are you camping out by yourself on the other side? Thank you for joining us for our discussion panel today. And I have uh, two gospel preachers with us who are going to be uh, talking about uh, this important subject of how we can be more effective as uh, maybe a spouse or as a parent uh, to uh, share the gospel of Christ with an unbelieving spouse or uh, maybe a child that's reached the age of accountability but hasn't yet made that decision in their life to obey the gospel. Uh, sitting here to my left is uh, Tom Hodge. Uh, Tom is the preacher for the Second Creek Church of Christ and this is uh, in Savannah, Tennessee and uh, it's kind of out in the country and it's a beautiful place over there. I've uh, been by the uh, the building there on a number of occasions as I would uh, travel different places. But Tom has uh, been preaching there for a relatively short period of time with this congregation. But uh, Tom, it's good to have you on our program today. This is a first time for you to be on Fabric of Family. Good to be here. It's a delight to have you here. And sitting beside uh, Tom is someone who has been 
uh, on the program before, and that's Corey Barnett, who preaches for the Fairview Church of Christ in Pulaski, Tennessee. Corey, it's good to see you again, and uh, you always do a wonderful job when you're able to, to be one of our guests, so thank you for coming. I, I want to go ahead and get right into our uh, subject matter about converting the uh, unbelieving family member, and, and I, I'm going to pose this question to Corey first of all, and, and just simply um, uh, ask the question of, of why is this an important subject, or, uh, or, or let me put it this way, uh, how is it that this subject has an effect upon the home? Well, like anything, if you're on different teams, you will have a problem. And if you're not working for the same goal, you're going to have friction sometimes in the family when it comes to people being faithful to the gospel and folks who've never rendered obedience to the gospel. I think about those license plates sometimes it says house divided and you see two mm. different college teams. Yeah. When you have a, a Christian who's trying to live for the Lord and do his will and you have a spouse or a, an accountable child who is not and mm. is pulling against that person, it can cause a lot of friction and a lot of, actually a lot of crying and a lot of tears can come from that because the person who is a Christian wants to see that loved one so badly render obedience to the gospel mm. and enjoy the life that he or she has. Excellent. I want to ask uh, Tom this question. Uh, I want us to, to focus primarily upon a, a spouse trying to convert a non-believing spouse initially, but I know some of this will, will tie into re regardless of what relationship we're talking about. But, but Tom, what are some things or a thing that, that a spouse can do to uh, help bring about a positive result in their loved one's life? Of course, the best place to go for that is, is to the Word of God itself. Uh, mm. Peter talks about that in 1 Peter chapter 3. And he instructs in this case, at least in the example he uses, it's, it's the wife mm. who is a, a member and uh, the husband is not. And, and he, talking to her, says, you know, her chaste or pure good example as a Christian wife will go a long way in him seeing the Word of God lived out in her life. And he says, without a word, in other words, it's not going to be her preaching to him or even nagging him. It's not going to be necessarily what she says, but how she lives. And as he sees that mm. up close, day to day, that's going to be the, the yeah. first main thing that will influence. So we're not minimizing, certainly, uh, our conversation, our speech, but, right. but the Bible emphasizes how that it's very, very important that first of all, uh, we get our own life right and, and we're responding in the way that we ought to as a Christian as well. Now, let's look at the flip side of that for just a moment and, and that's something positive we can do. Corey, uh, from past experience, maybe in counseling or talking with members or just observation uh, as a preacher having worked with congregations, what are some things or a thing that generally is going to bring about resistance and uh, negativity uh, in one's attempt to, to influence someone. One of the things that Tom mentioned was the nagging. Okay. And there can get to a point where in our endeavor to fulfill the Great Commission and go and preach the gospel to every creature, sometimes we have that strong connection to our family members and we might go sometimes too far if there is such a thing in, tr in our zeal to get them to obey the gospel that we can actually turn them off to it by the way, we just continually browbeat them because they're not doing it. That doesn't mean we don't take every occasion that is given to us to teach and to preach, but sometimes we have to be more tactful like our Lord was in the way that we approach different people. Mm -hmm. uh, in regard to the family situation, you already have that closeness, and if you get to a point where you, all you do is you make the person feel like, here we go again, here we go again, and you're not going to be as effective as if you did it mm -hmm. in such a way that showed them, I love you, I'm just wanting to tell you what changed my life. I want to show you what can change your life and go forward with that and hopefully they'll be more receptive. Well, you know, certainly there's a fine line between nagging and being persistent. Uh, we need to be persistent, but as you've rightly pointed out, that we don't want to go to such a, an extreme that it is interpreted or uh, believed to be nagging because that can have uh, certainly negative uh, consequences upon the relationship uh, as well. Barry, I think about it from this point of view. Our Lord didn't tell us to go into all the world and make people obey the gospel. Mm. And that includes in our family. Even though we want them to obey it, we're just supposed to preach it to them, teach it to them, and then we have to turn it over to their hands. If they are receptive, great. 
if they're not, in, and I know it's hard because they're family, we sometimes have to back off and give them another opportunity in the future. Well, that's some excellent points. Uh, I want to continue this discussion uh, with you two men in just a moment. We're going to take a, a brief break. We're going to watch uh, some other, another segment, and then we'll be back to continue. There's nothing more important for our homes than making sure that we all have the same eternal home in heaven. Did you know that you can be sure that you're going to heaven? This week's Tech Tip is a great website, youcanbesure.org. The site addresses pertinent questions that everyone needs to know. Is there really a God who's concerned about me? Can I really trust the Bible? So many churches, is, is one as good as another? Will this world end one day? What happens then? The site asks, why remain uncertain when you can be sure? Now, the main feature of YouCanBeSure.org is a five-lesson course that's all about certainty. You can be sure about God, about the Bible, about salvation. You can be sure about the church. You can be sure about eternal security. Each lesson in the course contains a brief study guide followed by questions that you can answer and submit right from your web browser. Your questions will be graded and sent back to you via email so you can see all the correct answers. No stamps, no trips to the post office, you don't even have to leave your home. You can even save the information to your computer's hard drive for reference a little bit later. You're also going to find a lot of sermon notes and articles in PDF format for you to study and enjoy on YouCanBeSure.org. It's definitely worth checking out. That's the letter U. C-A-N, the letter B, S-U-R-E dot org. I'm Robert Hatfield with your Family Tech Tip of the Week. Hey, hallelujah. Hey, praise God, Jehovah. Amen. 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 Do you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? Do you take this man to be your lawful wedded husband? We hear those terms and we hear those words over and over and over and over again. Unfortunately, 50% of marriages are going to end in divorce. If you live where I am in the state of Alabama, it's about 53% of all marriages will end in divorce. What is remarkable too is the fact that if you try it a second time, the percentages goes up to about 60 percent. And I dare you to try it a third time. Three strikes and you're out. 71 percent of third marriages end in divorce. This is what the psalmist says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Who's building your house? Who's building your home? Is the husband trying to build it? Is the wife building it? Or maybe even the children are trying to build the home? Or the marriage counselor? But the psalmist says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Whoever they are, whether the husband is trying to build it by himself, the wife is trying to build it by herself, the marriage counselor, the children, the psalmist says, they labor in vain. In other words, all that you are doing, all that we are doing to build the home is in vain unless the Lord is building the home. And so we are depending upon God to help us to build a house. He knows how to build a home. Matter of fact, he instituted the first home in the Garden of Eden. Oh, God knows how to build a family. He knows how to build a home. Would you allow him to build your home, your family, your house, except the Lord build the house, 
they labor in vain that build it. All that we are doing as individuals to build the house will be in vain unless we allow the Lord to build our home. This is Brother James Gray, the minister of the Eastside Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama, and this is a word for the family. We're back with uh, Tom Hodge, preacher for the Second Creek uh, Church of Christ in Savannah, Tennessee, as well as Corey Barnett, uh, minister at the Fairview Church of Christ in Pulaski, Tennessee. Uh, we were talking about the uh, relationship of a husband and wife uh, where you have a believer and unbeliever in that relationship and, and what the, uh, the believer can do to posi positively bring about uh, a good outcome as far as the conversion of their mate. But in this second segment, let, let, let's think a little bit about the, the parent-child relationship and what a parent can do to help bring about this positive result in their child's life. So uh, let's say that a, that a parent has a, a teenager, uh, a young person who has obviously reached the age of accountability. Uh, they know the difference between right and wrong, but they just seem to be disinterested in, in spiritual things. I mean, can a, a child who has that disposition even be reached? And if so, what are some things that we could do to, to help have a positive impact upon their life? Tom, let me begin with you. I think of two things that, that happen even before our children are born. We pray that we will be the example to them that we can be. And then when, as they grow up, number one, we actually live a faithful Christian life in front of them. And when we do make mistakes when we do sin we are honest about that we don't try to cover that up they see an honesty in us about everything and then number two uh, an ease of communication about spiritual things in other words little children mm. want to talk about God they want to ask about God and, and all these things let's encourage that let's give them what they can use at that time and as the years come and go they'll feel comfortable now when they hit those teenage years we all go through a, a, probably a phase of not wanting to talk about anything like that. That will pass, but what we've laid a foundation before will be remembered by these young folks. And Tom, I think what you said there, the example is so important. If teenagers look at their parents and see that their parents are wishy-washy themselves or that they're not as faithful as they should be. In other words, let's give an example. It's time for Sunday morning Bible study. Well, we'll go for worship instead. And we, they see a little disconnect there from the parents and they think, well, the parents don't take it so seriously. Why should I? And a lot of times it's hard to get beyond that as they grow older because that's going to be a very impressionable time for them. And if they see mom and dad not that interested, they're not going to be. So if a parent has not laid that groundwork as they should have. And, and some parents find themselves in a situation where uh, maybe they weren't even members of the church themselves when their children were little, but, but they have come to a knowledge of the truth, obeyed the gospel. Uh, but they're, 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 they're teenagers uh, in the home. They're, they're disinterested. I, I mean, is it at that point then hopeless? Uh, is there anything that a parent can do who's messed up, made mistakes, not lived as they should have before their kids? Can you begin that day or uh, what's your thoughts? Sure, sure you can. Thank goodness we, you know, uh, we have a second chance. Um, it's the honesty that young people would see in a, a parent that, that comes out and says, not only confessing before the church if we've been unfaithful, but first of all, to your family. Hey, I mm -hmm. haven't been the, the, the father, husband I, sh I need to be, and, they're, and we're serious about it. They, they see that, and of course, they'll, they'll hold us to account. They'll say, are you gonna be faithful now? Are you gonna be different? Mm -hmm. They wanna see a changed life, and so we need to give that to them. But uh, they, uh, it can be done. That change can be made. Even though they are still young, it's important, I think, that we try to treat them as mature individuals as best we can. I remember being a teenager and we think we know everything already at that age. We want to behave like adults at that age. If the parents come in and try to treat them that way as an adult, even though they're technically not there yet, but 
with that seriousness you're talking about, it'll go a long way because they're not feeling like, well, the parent's just making me do something else. Mm -hmm. They're talking to me on a level that we almost are equal in this. He's a Christian. I would be an equal Christian with him as well. And we're both on that same team again. We're fighting for this together. We're not pulling against one another. Well, let's, let's go just a little bit deeper here. Mm -hmm. and, and we've talked about maybe a, a teenager who hasn't uh, made that decision in their life. Parent wants to influence them positively. Uh, what about in a situation where a parent has a grown child? Uh, a grown child who's living in their own household. Uh, the parent wants that grown child to obey the gospel, but should they feel like, well, you know, they're, they're on their own now and there's nothing I can do? Absolutely not. Um, even though the, the time of youth is gone and those impressionable years are gone, that doesn't mean that you give up on someone, even if it's your family member, especially maybe if that's the case because of the closeness you have and the trust that you've built up. You still take the opportunity when it presents itself to teach and to preach to this person. You never know what a person's attitude will be on a certain day. And you never know how good your influence and what you have to say and, and present to them is going to be received. So never give up. I mean, even if they've got their own children already and they have left home for years, the gospel is said in such a way that it will reach those who are 40, it will reach those who are 20, and it shouldn't make a difference in regard to whether they're out of the home or in the home. And you know, uh, another thought that, that came to my mind as you were speaking, Corey, is, is how that sometimes maybe we, we look at this process as something uh, that if it's going to happen, it's going to happen in my life. Uh, but you know, really, uh, these are things, even after we have left this earth, uh, these are decisions that grown children can make after mom and daddy's gone. And, and, and like you said, never give up because we, we don't know. And uh, even if we leave this world and, and our children are not in the right relationship, if we have done what we should have done and set the example, and Tom, you know, what you mentioned about being honest, uh, I think that is so key here to say, hey, I have messed up. You know, I've not been the, the father, I've not been the mother uh, that I needed to be, and I'm sorry for that, and from this day forward, that's what I'm going to do. And even in a situation where you have grown kids, if they see that in you as a parent, regardless of whether they obey the gospel at that point in time, they will have that as an impression upon them forevermore. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the program today, and if so, why not call a friend or family member and ask them to watch Fabric of Family next time on this same broadcast channel. In our next program of Fabric of Family, we're going to be interviewing a young couple from North Alabama who had an unexpected and life-altering event to occur in their lives. And we're going to see how it is that they were able to find help to enable them to cope with something that is a very difficult family crisis that they faced within their home.